Well, thank you very much, Chime Choir. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Medford United Methodist Church. My name is Joe Monahan. I want to welcome you on behalf of myself, our associate pastor Kathleen Stoles, and the whole congregation. It's good to have you with us this morning. I hope each one of you will take a moment. There's a red attendance pad it's sitting on the inside of the pew. It should be anyway. And I hope that you'll pick that up, that you'll let us know that you've been here this morning, that you'll pass it down and then pass it back towards the center. It's one of the ways that we get to know one another's names. And if you are visiting with us today, maybe for the first time, I hope you'll take uh, some time to fill out the, the space at the bottom of the page where you can uh, provide us with your contact information. We would love to be able to let you know about things that are going on here at the church, so we look forward to being able to do that. A couple of announcements here as we are getting started. First, I want to say thanks to everyone who helped uh, with our box, our shoe box collection for the Interfaith Homeless Outreach Council. We filled 112 boxes uh, with toiletries for the homeless, so I'm really grateful to all of you for participating in that project, and it's especially meaningful uh, yesterday, we had a celebration of life for Diane O'Brien, who, uh, who passed away uh, last weekend. And we had um, a wonderful celebration of her life and talked about the ways in which uh, outreach was, was important to her in so many dimensions of her life. And so I want to thank everybody who took part in this project. It was one that she led for many years. And so we're grateful for this connection and uh, grateful to all of you for helping with that and for everybody who helped with the service yesterday as well. So one other opportunity to serve that I would uh, like to lift up in particular is that next uh, Friday night, so this, I shouldn't say next Friday, but this coming Friday, the 9th, we're, is that right? That's the right date, right? My brain is just not functioning as well as it could be. I'm, I'm, in, I'm like one cup of coffee short, I think, is my coffee deficit right now. So on the 9th, we're going to have an open house over our new facility in the Family Life Center. And we're going to be inviting the community, and especially the children of the community, families in the community, to come and join with us. We're going to have a bounce house, fun things for the kids, and uh, we need some help in order to be able to run it and staff it fully. So I hope that you'll con consider helping us, uh, and uh, the information is in the bulletin about who to get in contact with and what kind of help we need. So I hope that you'll uh, give that some consideration. And then finally, I want to lift up one more uh, opportunity to serve, which is going to be unfolding over the next few weeks. And so uh, for that, we've got a video I'd love to show you. Good morning, food fans. This is Ben Carl, representing our MUMC youth, and welcome to EFDN, the Easter Food Drive Network, here with our first March Madness Food Drive update. Once again, we are supporting both the Christian Caring Center in Pemberton and the Turning Point United Methodist Church Food Pantry in Trenton with this year's collection. And now, over to Outreach Chair Chris Carl to introduce the final four teams. Thanks, Ben. We are very excited to welcome three returning teams from last year's Final Four. So much for parity in this league. Representing the Southeast Bracket once again, we have the Pitts Bag Boxers. This team can be supported through your donations of items in boxes and bags, such as pasta, rice, mac and cheese, and juice boxes. Returning from the Southeast Bracket, we have the crowd favorite, the Toiletries from Arbor State. Any items like deodorant, lotion, toothpaste, and other toiletry items will help this team earn points. Next, returning from the Northwest bracket, the Cardinals from General Ignatius Filbert Tech, but we can call them the gift cards for short. This group is sponsored by Acme Markets and can be supported with donations of $15 Acme gift cards. And a big EFDN welcome to our newest competitor, the Buccaneers from George Mason Jar University. Please show your support to this team with donations of food items in cans and jars, such as canned fruits and veggies, tuna fish, peanut butter, and many more. A full list of items can be found in your bulletin and were linked in Friday's e-newsletter. They will also be available on the website soon. We welcome your donations as soon as they are available. Please drop them off in the narthex. Backed by popular demand, you'll be able to make your donations to our food drive through YouGiveGoods.com slash March Madness dash MUMC, which was also linked in the newsletter and will be linked on the church website. 
We will be able to track our own online donations and divide the food between both groups as well. So, Medford UMC, the ball is in your court. For Chris Carl and all of us here at EFDN, the Easter Food Drive Network, I am Ben Carl, signing off. Back to you, Joe and Kathleen. So this opportunity will be unfolding over the next few weeks, and uh, we invite you to take part and uh, follow the progress of our four teams. So thank you. Kathleen? Good morning. Good morning. I invite you to stand as you're able and join me in our call to worship. Come, all who are thirsty, says Jesus, our Lord. Come, all who are weak, taste the living water only Christ can give. Do your hands in the stream, refresh body and soul, for this river never runs dry. Come, all who are thirsty, says Jesus, our Lord. may be seated. I invite you now to join me in our opening prayer. Loving and living Lord, as we welcome you into our midst, we call upon you to hallow this time, that we may know your blessing and you may know our devotion, that we may know your presence and you may know our worship, that you may know your will, and you may know our willingness, that we may know you in the silence, and you may know us in our praise. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. God's grace is poured out here in abundance at Christ's table. All of us can be fed, sinners, saints, and everyone in between. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let's take a moment now to greet those around us with the peace of Christ.
I'd like to invite our children to come up for children's time. We have some children that would like to come on up. Come on up. Come on up. I've got a friend to show you. Well, he's kind of got a funny face. What do you think? Still cute? Yeah? Still cutie. So this morning, we're talking about the fact that Jesus sometimes appeared to be wasteful. So do you know what it is to waste something? What does it mean to waste something? Get something and not use it. Get something and not use it, right? Or have too much of something so you can't use it? Like too much lollipops. Too many lollipops, right, right. And so if you have too many lollipops, what can you do? Yeah, if you eat too many, you could get sick. But if you don't eat them, you could share them, right? You could save them. You could share them. Well, my friend that I brought with me today is a pack rat. Now, before I went to Arizona, I never knew that there really was something called a pack rat. Because pack rats, for me, mean that people, mean we people have too much. And so sometimes we call people that save too many things, we call them pack rats. But in Arizona, there really is a pack rat. And a pack rat, at least the ones by our house when we lived there, used to take lemons off of our lemon tree and hide them and save them. They loved lemons, apparently. And they saved them. And we would find them in the cabinets of our outdoor kitchen. And we didn't know how they got there. And we asked people, where are all these lemons coming from? And they said, I bet you have pack rats. So thankfully, they didn't store things in our house. They only stored things outside. But do you think, so you, Bradley, you think he's cute, huh? Yeah. He's kind of he's cute in an ugly kind of way. Or, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I, I found this pack rat puppet. And I thought today when we're talking about waste would be a wonderful time for pack rat. Because people shouldn't be pack rats. And I specifically want to talk to you about food and how much food we waste. So do you like cheese? Yeah. Yeah? I don't like white cheese. Well, this is, this is yellow cheese. This is the kind I like on my cheeseburgers, just good old Velveeta slices on my cheeseburgers. Me too. Yeah? Yeah, they're really good. So according to the things I read, we people in this country waste 40% of our food. So that means we take too much and we, if we can't finish what's on our plate, we scrape it in the garbage. Or maybe it means we buy too much at the store and then the date changes, like we have too much milk and then the milk goes bad. Sometimes when we don't finish our dinner, we do it in our compost. That's right. Oh, that's a great thing to do. I figured your family would probably be composters. That is great. That's what we should do with our extra food. We should put it into the compost. And then what happens to the compost after the food? What does the food do? It does. It turns to really healthy dirt. That's the best thing to do with our extra food. Because if we throw it out, it just goes into the garbage and nobody benefits from it, right? So if we, use, if we waste 40% of our food, that's almost half the food that we make that we buy and that we make. What else is in that basket? That, well, all I, had, all I brought for him today was cheese. So what 40% means is that if I had 10 slices of cheese, we could share these six slices and eat them, and these four, we would just throw them away. Wouldn't that be a waste? That would be a horrible waste. And we not only are wasting the cheese, but we're wasting the milk that made the cheese, and we're wasting all the energy that it took to make the cheese. We're wasting the plastic that was wrapping the cheese. We're wasting so much just by throwing that food away. So it would be much better if we found ways to use it, to recycle it and reuse it like composting. Absolutely. So thank you for that part of the lesson. That's really, really good. So we shouldn't be like pat rats. We should not waste but Pastor Joe's going to tell us about how Jesus appeared to be wasteful, but he wasn't really. 
So you've got to hear the rest of the story from Pastor Joe, okay? Before you go back to your seats, let's say a prayer together, okay? Gracious God, we give you thanks for the food that we have in abundance, and we pray that we might just take our share so that others will have enough to eat as well. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for coming up. morning. The scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. 
She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. We started this series about Jesus' bad habits um, by talking about how Jesus thought he was God. And then last week we talked about procrastination. And uh, I'm sorry to say I didn't finish my sermon any earlier this week either. (laughs) And this week we're talking about how Jesus appeared wasteful. So let's take a moment, let's pray together. God, we thank you for everything that you've done for us. We thank you for your gift the gift of of life that brings us here this morning, the gift of worship, the gift of praise and thanksgiving. We thank you this morning for the gift of the scripture and for these stories that remind us um, of everything that you've done for us and how much you've given to us. So we pray that as we gather here this morning that you might be at work in our hearts and our minds. Surround us with your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think it's a safe thing to say that if our ancestors were able to see the kind of throwaway society that we live in today, that they would be pretty appalled, actually, by kind of the casual nature of how we deal with almost every object that passes through our hands. When you think about it, almost everything that we touch is disposable on one level or another. There was a study, some scientists recently, because you know that plastic is a huge issue, especially plastic that that makes its way into our oceans is a huge issue. And so some scientists wanted to create some estimates, to start to measure how big of a problem this is. So they started to look at how much production of plastic had taken place from the time that it came into widespread use up to today. Their estimate that they came up with was nine, over nine billion tons of plastic. That's huge, like like you can't begin to wrap your head around that. And what they estimate further is that only about 10%, maybe not even that much, about 9% or 8% of the plastic that we use in the world today ever gets recycled. So when you step back from that and just consider the fact that here you are, you're drinking a soda out of a bottle and it might be, um, you know, it might take you 10 minutes to finish that soda, right? But that bottle is going to be around a long time, it could potentially be there for for maybe as long as 450 years. That's mind-boggling when we think about it. Unbelievably wasteful. So there's a story that's told in all of the Gospels about Jesus, about how when he fed the 5,000, one of the things that he made sure to do was to gather up all the broken pieces so that nothing might be wasted. And so we have this story that talks about how Jesus was concerned that nothing be left to waste. And yet today I want to talk about how Jesus was wasteful. Well, I'll tell you where this starts. It starts with the idea, if you read 
uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, right before we get to the passage that we read today, what you'll find there is you'll find a little description that was thrown about talking about Jesus. When people looked at his life, what did they see? Well, people said about him, here's Jesus, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend to tax collectors and sinners. So there is a sense that Jesus spent a lot of his time with people that maybe he shouldn't have been spending his time with. And so one of the things that you can say about Jesus is he's wasting his time. I think that that's how people like the Pharisees perceived it. Because here he is hanging out with folks that everybody knows is no good. So what's the point in a prophet going to deal with people who everybody knows is no, are no good? So what's the point of going and talking with the tax collectors? Everybody knows that the tax collectors will never come around. You could take that a little step further. Every time you see Jesus interacting with children, and you see him teaching children, instructing children, blessing children, people didn't want to be bothered with children. Famous teachers didn't want to be bothered talking to kids. Jesus was wasting his time. That's one of the themes, I think, that will recur over and over. Because Jesus, you know, Pharisees looked at him, Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the teachers of the Bible, they looked at his life and said, shouldn't a prophet spend time among people who really care, among people who are holy? And so Jesus did that from time to time. Now, the thing that's kind of funny about all these stories about Jesus, when he actually is in the company of Pharisees, and he gets invited to their parties, and he spends time with them, I find it humorous because I often imagine Jesus is never going to be invited back to this house. There is no way. Because if you read the story, for example, today's story, what happened as he is reclining at this table and eating with the Pharisees must have scandalized everybody. Here comes a woman that, according to the scripture, everybody knows has some kind of checkered past. And she comes in, and in the middle of everybody, she just interrupts this time. She kneels down, she grabs Jesus' feet, she's weeping, she's crying, she has this ointment, she spills it out, she cries all over his feet, washes his feet with her tears and with the ointment, and then wipes his feet with her hair. Now, isn't that the strangest, most scandalous thing, that you, not perhaps the, the most scandalous thing that you can imagine? But nonetheless, incredibly strange, right? And especially in the company of these holy men, these Pharisees. Now, you might say, well, how is it that, um, how did she get in anyway? Like, wasn't somebody like watching the door or something? So scholars say, and if you've ever been in, in, in the Middle East and visited some of these sites, maybe you can kind of visualize this. People lived much more closely together. Like a village was really tight. So in other words, my house might share a wall with your house, okay? Like we were that close, we're more like little apartments. Now, in the home of this Pharisee, he probably had a little bit more money, bigger home. But then all the more reason to, for his neighbors to be curious when he's having people over for dinner. So one of the things that may have happened was when somebody who had means had a party at their home, the poor would show up hoping that maybe, maybe, there would be something left over. That maybe the one who's hosting this party might have something for them. And so maybe that explains some of the reason why, you know, somebody might walk in on this party. But then you also have to picture in your mind how these kind of parties took place. So the picture that we have of Last Supper, you know, with uh, 13 people on one side of a table, right? Totally historically accurate, right? <laughs> Have you ever seen that meme? It's very funny. So Jesus goes up and he's asking for a table. How many do you have? 13, but I'd like it set for 26. <laughs> anyway. So you have to picture this image of how the room would have been set up. There would have been a low table, kind of set up in a U shape. And then around it, 
Jesus and his friends would have been reclining. They would have been like, like laying down on their elbows like this. And so that's why his feet are exposed. Now, Luke's version of the story is a little bit different in that it really focuses on this woman and who she is. Now, last week, if you remember, last week's story had a connection to this week's story in the sense that in the beginning of last week's story, when we we're talking about Lazarus, Lazarus' sister Mary is identified as this woman who, who uh, bathes Jesus' feet with her tears and wipes them with her hair. Now, Luke's version of the story is a little bit different. It happens much, much earlier. It happens while Jesus is still in Galilee before he goes to Jerusalem. All the other gospel writers, they also include a story like this, but it happens much later. But Luke is concerned to tell the story to really emphasize the forgiveness and kind of the, the profound act of love that's happening here. What happens in the other Gospels, and it's a dangerous thing maybe to take the details and try to put them together too much, but what happens in those other Gospels is that, yes, people are scandalized by what she's doing, but they're even more scandalized by the fact that, don't you know how much this stuff costs? And further, they go further and say, it's, it's something that could have been sold for 300 denarii. Now, 300 denarii was like a year's wages. So, I don't know, if you want to think of a, what mentally, what might be an equivalent of that, you know, what's the median wage in the United States today? I think it's something like, um, household income is like 40 some thousand dollars or something like that, I think. That's a lot of money, right? That's like taking 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars worth of stuff and pouring it out all at once in this act that, to what end? All the people around Jesus say, well, you should have taken that and sold it and given the money to the poor, which is a very practical thing to say, but Jesus says, no, leave her alone. And in our story that we read today, our version of the story from Luke, we understand that there's something happening here that is so profound and so powerful that has to do with what has happened before. Now, we don't know. It's really hard for me to imagine so I imagine it is for you too. You know, so just this person, maybe she's heard Jesus preach a couple times and then she just shows up at this dinner party and all of a sudden she's going to pour out $20,000 worth of ointment on his feet? That's hard to really wrap your head around, right? So I have to think that there has to be more to this story, another piece of it that hasn't been told. Jesus knows her. He has to know her. He has to know where she's come from. He has to know what's going on. And so when she kneels down at his feet, he understands that she is grateful. And what Jesus has learned is that it's just as important when somebody tries to show you their gratitude to be able to receive it gracefully as it is to actually to be able to show your gratitude toward others. I think it's something that most of us haven't had enough practice at. So yes, Jesus is wasteful. He lets her just pour out $20,000 on his feet. But the thing is, she's wasteful too. It's her $20,000. There's something to this. There's something profound that's happening in that moment. This is an act of love that's taken to an extreme. Now, I bet you some of you understand and have had some experience with, what do you want to say, these kind of grand gestures of love. I bet you some of you are grandparents who have taken your grandchildren to Disney World, and you paid the bill and you didn't think twice about it, right? Took somebody on a cruise, didn't think twice about it because you really wanted to say, listen, I'm doing this because I love you. I bet you some of you can think about the time when you were first maybe dating that person who's special in your life. Maybe your husband, your wife now, sitting next to you. You think about those moments when you first met 
and some of the plans that you made to impress that person, right? The lengths to which you were willing to go, the money which you were willing to spend, the time that you were willing to invest to make a plan to keep it secret, right? Secret, very important, right? You come up with this plan and you make something really special happen. Now, it's extravagant. And you might say, that's a waste of time. It's a waste of money, right? For what? For a few moments worth of memories. Well, maybe those few moments turned out to be a lifetime of memories at the end of the day. But we're familiar with these extravagant acts of love and grace. We value them. They're important to us. Even though when you take a step back from it and really think about it, it seems awfully wasteful. But Jesus did these things in the extreme. There's a passage in Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. If you've not read it recently, I'd encourage you to read it. It talks about, it's kind of Martin Luther King working out a little bit how he feels about being called an extremist. And so his mind is working on this. What does it mean to be an extremist? And he's wrestling with it. And he's saying, you know, I'm not sure how I felt about that, but eventually I came around and I, I embraced it. And he says, you know why I embrace it? Was not Jesus an extremist for love, he says. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? And he talks about the idea that comes to us from the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, love your enemies, forgive those who curse you, bless those who persecute you. Is that not a wasteful thing to do? Because isn't it true? A lot of people, you're going to spend a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy trying to love them, and they're never going to love you in return. They might not even ever like you. But yet, Jesus does it. He's willing to waste it. Why? Because he understands that these grand gestures mean something in the world. They mean something to us. They tell us something about who God is. It's not... It's not, a, um, you know, it's not a coincidence that one of Jesus' grand gestures takes place at a wedding. Do you know what I'm talking about? So Jesus shows up to this wedding. Wedding is a huge party back in those days. I mean, we have big parties now, right? But this was something that would last like a whole week. People are traveling from all over. They're coming in. And so when your friends travel, you know, three, four, five days to get to you, you can't just say, okay, we'll have a couple hours worth of party, we'll have dinner, and then we'll send you home. It doesn't really work that way. It's like a whole week. Well, what happens when you run out of wine partway through the week? Now you really have a problem. So they come to Jesus. Actually, his mother comes to him and says, they're out of wine. Jesus resists at first, but finally he comes around. He says, see those water jars over there? Go ahead and dip Dip in those and see what comes out. And says that these jars, the scripture tells us that the jars were something like 20 or 30 gallons each. or six of them. That's 180 gallons of wine. Now I did the math, okay? Converted gallons to milliliters and all that. That's like 75 cases of wine. Is Jesus not wasteful in an extravagant way there in that moment? Absolutely. But in every case, when Jesus, when he wants to make a point about who God is, a point with $20,000 worth of perfume, with 180 gallons worth of wine, when Jesus wants to make a point by pouring out his life on the cross, what's more wasteful than that? It's always about this grand gesture that shows us how much God loves us and what God is willing to do in this world. So I'm wondering, you know, is the problem perhaps that we've not been wasteful enough, that we've not been willing to be as wasteful as Jesus is? You know, the title of the sermon was 
uh, supposed to be Jesus appeared wasteful. I think I'd make the argument Jesus actually was wasteful because he was willing to throw God's love, God's forgiveness, God's grace around everywhere. And he didn't care whether it returned back to him or not. So my question to you this week is, are you willing to be wasteful like Jesus was wasteful? Are you willing to show forgiveness to someone who didn't ask for it? Are you willing to show grace who doesn't under, to someone who doesn't understand that they need it? Are you willing to love someone even though, you know what, they may never, ever love you in return? Are you willing to be wasteful like Jesus? Amen? Baby seated. So um, let me just make one more announcement. Um, you see, Ginger is ready to receive your offering today, and she, uh, I was trying to figure out why you're wearing the hat, but I understand now why you're wearing the hat. So uh, Ginger is the president of our United Methodist Women, and you see some information about their event that's coming up um, just next weekend in the bulletin, and uh, it's about bonnies and, wait, bonnets and bunnies. And uh, so we welcome you to come, uh, come to that. So you can take, some, uh, take a look at what's in, in the bulletin about that. Sorry about that, Ginger. So I want to share with you a celebration as we get ready to receive today's offering. So last weekend, we talked about the goal that we had to raise $30,000 in order to finish the kitchen in the Family Life Center. And so I am very pleased to announce to you that we didn't just meet our goal, we exceeded our goal, thanks to all of your donations. So we are at about $31,476. And I think that there might have been even a little bit more that came in after that, a few hundred dollars after that. So I am really grateful to all of you, um, just kind of blown away and amazed um, and just incredibly blessed. So we're excited that uh, we're able to take this next step in bringing uh, to fruition kind of the full vision of everything that we talked about and dreamed about uh, for, this, for this new facility. And so we thank all of you, and we thank God um, for you and the fact that you've 
been willing to share so generously from your gifts. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's continue now by offering God our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. with me. Make us foolish enough in our generosity, O God, that we might become wise enough to know how much our gifts can bless others, the hungry, the lonely, the searching, the weak. Let our generosity be evidence of your grace in our lives, that our ministry might bear witness to that grace in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, as we gather here around the table, I'll remind you that the table does not belong to the United Methodist Church, but it belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the one who makes the invitation. He's the one who invites us. He says... All of us are welcome here. All those who seek to live in a new relationship with God and with their neighbor through him are welcome to come and partake. So all of you are welcome here this morning. As we uh, receive today, we'll receive by intinction, which means that you'll be given a piece of bread to dip in the cup. And uh, we'll come by the center, we'll return by the side aisles. We have a gluten-free option available. If you need gluten-free communion this morning, please I just say so, and we'll make sure that that's what you receive. If you can't come forward for whatever reason, please let us know. We'll be sure to bring the elements to you.
But as you're coming forward, we invite you to be in prayer for that person who's in front of you in the line so that each person can be prayed over individually this morning. Let's continue with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And because God is so good, we offer this morning our joys to God. What kinds of joys do we have to share? That we're all here. All right. Oh, uh, well, we're celebrating your presence Glad and to hear uh, that. lack of pain. Yes. <laughs> Tanya? Amen. Amen. That's good news. Amen. Yeah. Others? And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, and we trust that when we gather together around the table in his name and we offer our prayers to you, that you hear us. And so we come to the table today with concerns on our hearts. What are some of those concerns that we'd like to lift up this morning? Continued support, yes. For all those who have lost loved ones, recent days, recent months, that hole in the heart, may it heal. Yes. The ongoing uh, mental health crisis in our country. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yes. Finally, Lord, we thank you for your son and for all that his coming means for our lives and for the world. By the baptism of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church and you delivered us from slavery to sin and death. And you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, and then he broke the bread and he shared it with his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He shared it with his disciples and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Now pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of the bread and the fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen, amen. Hosanna in the 
confidence of the children of God, let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'll invite those who will be serving with us today to come forward.
Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to share together in this meal that unites us with Christians around the world. We give you thanks for the amazing mystery that unites us as one, as the body of Christ, to be your hands, your feet, your voice, and your heart around the world. May this meal strengthen us, give us courage and patience to do the work that you would have us do. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. So go forth from this place to be wasteful, just as Jesus was wasteful. Wasteful with the things that belong to his God, that belong to his Father. Love, the forgiveness, the mercy, the grace that he shared so freely. Go forth to be wasteful. In Jesus' name.